Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Today's edition of Ask an Airstreamer is all about tips to set up your campsite. Before introducing our panelists, I want to take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris, and in addition to being an Airstream owner myself, I get to work with other Airstreams, other Airstream owners to share their curi stories of curiosity, adventure, and exploration in their Airstream. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's session is being recorded and will be published on airstream.com next week along other editions of Ask an Airstreamer. In other words, don't worry about writing everything down. You'll receive an email to this video later next week. To submit your questions at any point today, go ahead and click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. We'll do our best to answer all of them, but if we run out of time, we'll share an email address at the end to submit your questions. We'll also have a dedicated Q&A section at the end where we'll share a promo code for Airstream Supply Company, which is part magazine, part travel guide, and part outfitter. And lastly, there's a two-question survey that will be emailed right after we wrap up today. We'd love your feedback so we can learn things that you liked and things that we could do better in future editions. So let's take a look at what we're going to cover. First, we'll talk about the steps to take when setting up your campsite, some of which take place even before you pull into a site. We'll share some of our favorite products to make camping more enjoyable and easier. We'll have a dedicated section that talks about uh, setting up camp with dogs. And then we'll share some Airstream resources to make uh, camping easier and more enjoyable. And a quick call out, today's session is really focused for new Airstream owners, uh, folks who might be waiting for a delivery of their Airstream uh, or folks who are curious about joining the Airstream community. So if you're a seasoned camper and you have you know, maybe more than 10 or, or 12 trips uh, under your belt, uh, you'll, we'll probably cover a lot of material that you already know. So with that out of the way, I'm, I'm excited to introduce Ryan, uh, whose pictures want to make me go out and, and be in the wilderness right now uh, in, in his base camp. But Ryan, thanks so much for take, taking the time to join us and for being part of the Airstream community. If you would just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got here. Awesome, thanks for having me, Chris. Happy to be here. Uh, my name is Ryan Ponto, uh, along with my wife, Melissa. We live up in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, just in Canada, not too far from the Rockies. We luckily picked up our Airstream just at the end of 2019. It's a 2019 Base Camp X. And we kind of use that just to take our camping to the next level. And as you can see, bring our dogs with us. Um, they don't really fare too well in a tent if we want to go anywhere that they can't come. So the Airstream gives us a lot more freedoms to be able to bring them everywhere we want to go. And then just, you know, really enjoy the road that much more when we're out on our adventures. Awesome. Well, th thanks again for, for taking the time. The, the first part, I think, to really uh, go and have a great camping experience, especially for, for folks who are new to Airstreaming, is to know your Airstream, know how it works, uh, get familiar with how it's, how it's set up. And so I really love the idea, whenever I'm talking to people who are, who are just getting started, this idea of camping local, uh, you know, it, that could be in the driveway, that could be at your local campsite, but this idea of so much information is shared with you when you take home your Airstream with, at your dealership. And it's one thing to, Ryan and I were just talking about this, it's one thing to have a, a dealer kind of show you things and maybe you're following them, but to actually do it yourself on your own. So you know, before you do that epic 2000 mile road trip, uh, stay local, uh, get, get to know how your, the, the different systems work, understand what you really need to not only set up camp, but how do you organize things inside? And then another part too is if you want to, um, it's easy to simulate a, a full hookup campsite, right? You, you connect the water and you connect the electricity from, from your house if you're there or even at your local campsite. But if you want to experience boondocking and wonder what that's like to go out and camp in a national forest or BLM land, just unplug everything and see what the experience is like. So Ryan, I know similar experience uh, with you, part, part excitement, part strategy when you got your base camp. So tell us what you guys did. Yeah, ours, ours was a bit of luck. It was, we picked up our camps at our trailer in April. So it was still a little cold, still snow on the ground up here. Um, and Melissa was just so excited that she wanted to go out and stay in it. And so we have, we actually have a spot in our backyard that the trailer fits and that's where we keep it. So we had it parked there ready to go on our first trip in a couple of weeks. And it, I think it was a Tuesday night. And Melissa's just like, well, why don't we go stay in the trailer? 
So we went out, we, you know, figured things out. We got the heat running and we did actually have power and water. Well, no, we didn't have water connected because it was still freezing temperatures, but we did have power connected. Um, figured out how to set the bed. We stayed out there right in the backyard. So it was really nice. Um, figured out a few quirks like solar panel. We had a loose connection, so our solar wasn't charging properly. So we were able to figure that out. And it just made it nice to kind of work through it on our own without somebody showing us. And if something went wrong, it was no more than 12 steps to get back inside our house where it was uh, a lot warmer. That's right. That's right. It's, I think it's, it's a great, great advice and something for folks to consider as they're beginning their, uh, their airstream journey. So the, the, the first part for me, and I, I love the, the planning part of camping. So where am I going to go? What, what spots am I going to stay in? Uh, where am I going to stay? Um, so this idea of really getting oriented with your airstream, what side is the view that you like to, to have um, you know, be and what side does the awning open up to? What side are your, your utilities on? So really starting to get a good understanding of once you drive into a site, especially if you're you know, at a site like this in the picture where you have uh, plenty of options to choose from, uh, just getting oriented with where you where and how you want things set up. And then my one of the things that I do is I'll go in and, and use the satellite view on Google Maps just to get a sense of like, all right, am I planning to use solar? Is there a lot of sun where I'm going to be? Like, can I rely on these things just to try to remove some of the variables before I actually you know, pull up and, and try to get into a site? So uh, Google Maps is a great, great tool. And then some websites, Compendium is a great one. Uh, we'll have a lot of reviews around noise and cell phone signal. So again, I always try to remove a lot of the variables before I even go pull up to a site. So I know what I'm getting myself into as best I can before I get there. So other things to consider, especially if you're at an established campsite. So these are campsites that have you know, usually a, a gravel or concrete or asphalt pad, um, you know, sometimes utilities, but fundamentally two different types of sites here. Uh, one is a back-end site. Uh, so uh, as if, if you're with an Airstream travel trailer, uh, as the name would uh, uh, give you a clue, you actually have to you know, back into the campsite versus there are ones that are pull-throughs. So you don't have to back up at all. You can just pull right through. When it's time to leave, you hook up and you just pull right out. So Brian, give us some, some high-level considerations for both of these sites that folks will encounter out there. For sure. Um, and actually, funny enough, that campsite on that previous slide, we we lucked out, being that our trailer was small enough to fit in one of the only spots on the water. Um, nice. With the base camp, we actually have the door back. We keep, we sleep with it open in the summer, so that actually opened to the lake. So we that was Beautiful. actually a bit of luck and not so much planning, um, which does happen from time to time. So the two main sites obviously you have pull throughs or back in sites at most established campsites uh, if you're boondocking obviously that's going to be a different story altogether but usually you're going to drive around and find somewhere you can park it no matter what um, with the pull through sites those are usually a lot easier for your first times when you're first going um, especially more so if you have a longer trailer something that's a little more tricky to maneuver um, and as well if you're so solo so if you don't have anybody else if you're going out on your own um, the pull-through sites are going to make your life a lot easier because they're set up nice. You can drive in. Usually they're all set up so your services and everything are on the right side. And it's going to save you a lot of time and headache, especially if you haven't backed up a trailer much. Um, the back-end sites, uh, usually a little more private. They're a little nicer. Um, I find, at least in my experience, you can um, you know, back into an area that's nice and treed and it's a little more private. Um, if you have services and you obviously don't need to worry about it much as solar, so the big key with that is having somebody with you to help spot. Um, you know, you, last thing you want to do, especially if you got your brand new trailer, is go out, back it in, and smack into a tree or wreck some of that nice aluminum finish. Um, so taking a good look at the sites, either pull through or back in before, is good. But then just you know, with the back in sites, making sure you have a second person. If you are solo and you don't, um, usually there's somebody at the campsite, either the staff or even another camper that you know have, that are more than willing to help get you into your site. And you're you're absolutely right. People are generally very friendly, eager to help. Um, what are some of the things, especially when backing up? I feel like it's very important to have a 
a common set of, of language. So, I mean, stop me and stop. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, but hey, go to the left, go to the right can be, I think, a little bit confusing because you're, you know, you have this thing that's doing the opposite of what the steering wheel is doing. Um, is any any language tips that, that you can share when you're you know, working with someone to back into a website in terms of navigation? Yeah, so definitely establish what you're talking about. If a left or right is, you know, driver left or right. Um, one tip that another couple actually gave us that they said save their marriage was if you don't have rate walkie talkies because not everybody has walkie talkies yeah. but everybody has a cell phone so they call each yeah. other and they talk on yeah. each other's phone so you can hear because if somebody's you know 20 30 40 feet back from you standing in a campsite it's hard to hear them inside a vehicle um and then the other big one is when you're backing up make sure the person knows it if they can't see you you can't see them that's um, right my wife is still learning this one even three years in she still likes to go back there and guide me in and disappear. So mm -hmm. it, it's something that takes practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think a good thing to remember too, especially with, you know, many folks are towing with diesel diesel trucks. So there's the engine noise in the front for the driver. You're, you know, 30 feet back. And so good communication, I think, is is really key. I often will also just, if, if I'm driving, I'll put the, you know, the truck in park and just go out and see for myself. And then with my spotter, figure out what, what the plan and the next move is. Um, yeah, that's definitely, seeing, yeah, go, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, yeah, that's definitely a good point. Um, walking the site is always nice too. Um, yeah. That'll kind of lead into the next steps as well. That's right. All right, so perfect segue to this next slide here. So what are some other considerations that, that, you, should, um, that you should think about? Not only when picking the spot, right? You're looking at the map, uh, if you're reserving or even if it's a big spot and you're doing some off-grid camping, where in the spot you should be. So walk us through some things that folks should consider. So with, with the spots, obviously, you know, picking one that fits your trailer is key. Um, like I said, we're lucky ours is tiny, so we pretty much fit anywhere. Um, but if you've got a 33 foot and you're taking it out, yeah, you really got to look at where you're taking it. Um, I mean, I, and even you can check with the campsites as well, because some of them, you know, might have steeper accesses and have issues with that, which I know some trailers have, you know, scraped on the bottom and coming in and out of different campsites. Uh, as far as what you're looking for, you know, when you walk, when you, when you do get there and you pick the campsite, checking the area, checking the ground, you know, looking for what's the most level area or where you want to situate the trailer. Um, you know, where your awnings are. If you have multiple awnings, are you going to clear the trees in the back? Um, and then as you know, where the fireplace is, can the picnic table be moved? Um, different things on the site that kind of work, work nicely. So given a quick walk of the site usually makes life a lot easier once you do get there and back it in or drive it through. Um, and then from there, you know, it's, uh, yeah, like a good point there too, Chrissy, you had on the list here is just about sunny or shady. Um, if you do or don't have power, if you do have power, well, then it's, you know, it's not a big deal and it's nice because it keeps you cooler. But if you're running off solar, um, then you might have to consider if your rooftop solar is going to be in the shade that you have the secondary port on the Airstream connected to a suitcase solar panel that you can move and, you know, chase the sun. That's right. Always that constant negotiation between what's the temperature, solar for the sun, staying cool in the shade. Uh, this, this next one uh, around leveling. So you've you've surveyed the spot, you've got your plan together, you've you've backed in, you know where you're going to put it. And so now before you disconnect, uh, if you are using a uh, if you're using an Airstream travel trailer versus a motorized one, before you disconnect it from the tow vehicle, you need to level it. And at, when I first, I'll, I'll be the first to say, when I first started Airstreaming, I was like, oh, this is kind of close enough. And I would eyeball it and then I would go to cook a meal and you know all the oil would go to the side of the pan or the bathroom door wouldn't quite you know stay open by itself so um, some minor inconveniences but other ones will be you know <clears throat> the refrigerator needs needs to be level certain appliances just might not work uh, and overall it just makes a better experience to have a level level ground so Ryan I know that uh, you do this a lot <clears throat> excuse me walk us through your your approach to to leveling your airstream for sure. So, you know, once we get there, we sit, you know, we walked through the site and checked everything out. Um, then we will work at getting the base camp right where we want it. Um, 
as far as orientation for what we want for the campsite. So we'll back it in, we'll do a quick check. Right now, we're a little rudimentary. I just use a simple uh, bubble level and I toss it on the floor in the trailer and I check my level you know, side to side uh, for either side of the wheels. And based on that, then I'll either put uh, one, two or you know, three leveling blocks under a tire. So I'll, I'll place them in, either in front or in behind and then you just back up onto them. And then from there, double check again, 90% of the time, we've been able to get it pretty close on the first go. Once we're level side to side, that's when we'll go into, you know, we'll, we'll chalk the other wheels, we'll unhook. And then from there, we're able to use the, um, the tongue jack to level the trailer front to back. Um, one key thing to note there is that leveling the trailer should always be done with the wheel blocks and the tongue jack, and it should never be done with the stabilizers. Stabilizers aren't designed to lift the trailer. They're simply there to help stabilize it. So once we get it level, then that's when you would lower, lower down the stabilizers. Um, one trick that I kind of like to do, being that it is a single axle, I don't actually, I can't put the uh, brace between the tires to you know, stop the roll back and forth is, I'll, whatever side my wheel trucks are on, I'll actually over jack the stabilizer just a hair, and then I'll kick the wheel trucks in a little more and then lower it back down, which kind of snugs those wheel trucks in and I found helps keep the trailer more stable. It's good, uh, good, good things for folks to consider. It was on the last slide you talked about it just just to call it out because right now we're at the point where we're disconnecting the tow vehicle uh, yes. from the trailer. And if you are at a campsite where you're you're plugging into utilities, this is the place where I make sure that the electric cord is long enough and my water hose is long enough and my sewer hose is long enough before I disconnect and then try to hook up everything, which we're going to do in the next stage. And then realize I need to hook everything up and, and do that again. So just a just a reminder uh, for folks who um, who might have some questions. So William has a question here. It says, "Hey, if uh, if I have a double axle trailer, do I need to have leveling blocks under each?" Um, I I have a double axle um, trailer, and I have put um, leveling blocks under under each of those just to get that whole side up because you're basically putting um, you know changing the head of the axle, which is then connected to the frame to get everything. So I've had better better results uh, by doing, um, using leveling blocks under both wheels. All right, so it's just some tools to make all of this easier. I know that uh, we're gonna drop some links to this and this is Airstream Supply Company. So this is owned by Airstream. Uh, and the benefit there is they're close to the product. They're working uh, with Airstream owners to get feedback and actually test things in the field. So I'm just gonna walk through this, this slide pretty quickly. Um, number one here is, is a simple bubble level like Ryan was talking about um, that you can use in your Airstream. Number two here, these are the Lynx levelers. So they're kind of giant Legos. They snap together. You can make different heights. Uh, I've had mine Airstream now for six, seven years, and I've had the same set. They last forever. Um, and then the wheel chalk, so important to, before you disconnect your tow vehicle from your Airstream, you want to make sure that the wheels are secure. So if there is any sort of incline, uh, you're not going to have any surprises. Um, a jack plate, so this would go under number four. Uh, this would go under the uh, tongue jack in the front. If you do have some softer ground underneath it, um, this just gives you a, a bit a, a bit of a larger platform to have a, a secure grounding of that jack. And I actually have number five here, uh, which makes it really easy. Uh, this is a little Bluetooth module, which is the smaller piece on the left. And then you pair it with your iPhone. And the thing I really like about this is you get a good sense. I've had good luck with actually pairing it while I'm in the tow vehicle uh, to the trailer. And I can get a good sense of like, all right, is this a little bit more level if I have a big area, like at a primitive campsite, or is this area a little bit more level? So even before I get out um, of the vehicle, I can get a sense of what is the trailer experiencing from a level standpoint. So um, it's super, uh, super easy to be able to, to get a sense of, uh, of what you're up to next. So this next one, uh, we're gonna go through hooking up utilities. So we have our Airstream parked where we want, we're level, stabilizer jacks are down. And now if we're at, a, at a, a campsite that has any sort of utilities, we're just gonna go step 
step by step on, on what that looks like. So this slide is really meant to just help provide some definitions around uh, the different types of utilities that you might find when people are throwing around terms like this campsite has partial hookups. Usually I found that that happens to be just electricity and there isn't water uh, and, there, and there isn't a sewer hookup. Sometimes you'll get water and electricity, but no sewer. So when people say partial hookups, that, that's what that means. Full hookups uh, is, is exactly that. So kind of being you know, connected uh, to an infinite supply of water uh, and an infinite supply of electricity and then a way to uh, empty your tanks along the way. And then of course, off-grid campsites, uh, you just get the beautiful view there. You really don't get, uh, you don't get any utility. So I'm gonna take the first one just to, to walk us through connecting our Airstream to electricity and then Ryan will uh, take us to water and then I'll go back through on the, um, the sewer side of things. So this first one, the panel on the left is, is what you can expect to encounter at a typical campsite uh, that, that has uh, either partial hookups or, or full hookups. So every, every campsite will have a pedestal that looks like this, um, three different plugs on the bottom. So from left to right, we have a 30 amp plug. Uh, in the center, we have a typical household plug. So this is probably 15 to 20 amps. And then on the right, we have a 50 amp plug. So you're probably saying, well, which, which one is right for my Airstream? And the rule of thumb here is usually if your Airstream has a two air conditioners, you're gonna be on the right side. It'll be at a 50 amp uh, plug. Uh, and if your Airstream has, Airstream has one air conditioner, you're gonna be on the 30 amp side. So Ryan, you're a 30 amp. Uh, my Airstream has uh, one air conditioner, 30 amp too. So uh, just to give folks some guidance on what to expect. And, and is what, Airstream has transitioned to recently is using smart plugs, which are the ones with the orange uh, plugs on the right-hand side of the screen. And those are really helpful. That's the twist lock. I've, if folks are familiar with that, uh, this is now a much easier way to connect um, your Airstream. So the way I approach this is I will get my power cord out. <clears throat> I will make sure that the breaker breakers are off. And these breakers are usually labeled pretty well, but um, three different breakers here. The one on the right is actually uh, bridged together. So the one on the right is for the 50 amp plug. You can tell that has a little five zeros in there. And then there's a 20 and a 30. So I usually just turn them all off because I'm only going to use one. And if there was something wrong with the panel, I'd rather it uh, not be live. And then I'll, this is when I'll make the connection between the Airstream and the pedestal. So with the power off, um, and I'll, I'll talk about the surge piece in a minute for as an optional piece, but with the power off, I'll plug into the pedestal, I'll plug into the Airstream, and then that's where I'll turn the power on. And then there's an indicator light on the top of the smart plug that tells you it's getting power. Um, some folks might want to, uh, I've seen folks before they actually connect their RV, they'll put a, a multimeter on it, make sure it's putting out good power. There are also tools that you can use. There's this uh, surge adapter here that will also analyze the power and actually gets plugged in between the pedestal and then your power cord. So if there was a surge uh, at the campsite, it's, a, it's a basically a buffer between the rest of the grid of campsite and your Airstream. And I think the other important uh, piece to have here as well is a, I have a kit of adapters. So I'll have uh, even though my trailer is only 30 amps, I'll have an adapter goes from 50 to 30, I'll have an adapter that goes from 20 to 30, just in case whatever I might encounter. It's I've run into issues where I'll get to a campsite and the 30 amp won't work, but the 50 amp will. So that's where having having the adapters is uh, is really versatile. Ryan, anything that you'd add to the slide based on on how you uh, how you approach it? Um, no, I, th I think you covered it all. It's pretty similar in ours. Yeah, being the 30 amp is nice and easy. Um, making sure that you're close enough to the plugs when you set up camp is always a good thing to check before you unhook and level the trailer. Nothing worse than getting all that work done and realizing you don't have a long enough cable. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, Jill has a great question too, just in terms of the sequence. So 
she says, uh, do you plug in the surge guard and then turn the power on and then hook it into the RV? Um, not a bad approach at all. Make sure that what the surge guard is actually seeing um, it is good power. The one that I have will actually look at the power. And then if it says it's good, it'll pass it through. So just read the manual on, on the one that you have, but, but Jill, your approach is an extra layer of precaution. Not a bad idea at all. Um, so JRAM asks, can a 30 amp RV plug be safety plug be safely plugged into a 30 amp outlet? Um, so not a qualified electrician, but my experience has been yes. Um, if you have a 30 amp um, plug, that means the most power that your RV is going to take is 30. So connecting it to a larger pipe, in this case, the 50 amp to deliver electricity, no problem at all, because you're never going to put more, um, more power through that cord than what it can handle because your, your, um, your RV, your Airstream is only 30 amps. So good, good question there. Um, let's switch over to water. Uh, yeah, just uh, it, like I'll just you... yeah I'll add on to that one. So basically, the behind that, as long as you have the adapter, um, yeah. your airstream only pulls so much electricity and so much power, and the different amperages that are between the different plugs are how much it can provide. So it's not like That's you right. plug into a fifty; it's pumping fifty amps into your trailer and it's gonna you know set it on fire. It's that plug can handle up to fifty amps. But if your trailer is only drawing five amps, it's only going to draw five amps out of that plug. That's right. Good, good, uh, good build to that. Walk us through all things, all things water and air streaming. So for water, um, obviously you have your options between you know having using your freshwater tank or having a water hookup at the city uh, service side of things. So two few things to check with that. Um, obviously know whether or not you're going to have full service in water. Um, and as well, time of year, I mean, more so for us than maybe some of our friends further south is important. Because um, for us, you know, if it's early season in the camping, there's a chance that the water is still frozen and we actually won't have water service. It did happen to us on our very first trip. <laughs> um, so in that situation, that's when I would actually fill up the freshwater tank before we even left home. Um, which when we're doing that, filling up from home, it's still through a water garden hose. Um, we did have a nice little filler neck uh, attachment. It's a clear filler tube that has a valve on it. So that makes it really nice for filling up. But then as well, we also run a inline water filter. Um, not so much for when we fill up at home, but different campsites, you're not necessarily sure what the water quality will be like. Um, alternatively, if you're going somewhere and you know there is water fill ups there. Um, I personally like towing without the water fold just to, you know, save on weight. Uh, so that once I get there, we'll fill up the water fresh tank and then go and park. Um, now, if you have the city hookup, it's a little bit different process. Obviously, you'll get to your campsite, you will need a fresh water hose. And you're able to connect to a. It's usually a regular garden tap hose that you connect to. Um, running the inline filter is nice because again, different campsites have different water quality and it's just nice to run that through a cleaner. And then you connect it to a separate connection on the back side of the trailer instead of actually using a fill hose. Uh, the one thing to note with this is when you're on city water, you actually don't need to run your water pump inside the trailer and you don't want to because there is no water in that fresh water tank for it to draw a pump from and that pump will be running dry, which can you know damage the pump and prematurely wear it out. Good, uh, good things for, for people to consider. One, one addition to that too, when looking at different hoses in this situation, either to, to fill the water tank or even to hook up to city water is to make sure that you have one that's specifically rated for drinking water. Um, so there's some material choices there that uh, hose manufacturers will make. So you're, you're not um, using anything that would be harmful. So everyone's, uh, I think, favorite part of RVing when we talk to people is uh, emptying the tanks by far. Um, so I, I've heard this called lots of things, one of which is the stinky slinky. Um, but if you're either dry camping or off-grid boondocking uh, or even you know, connected to a, uh, a full hookup site, you'll have to encounter this at, at, at some point in time. 
Um, and the way that I approach this uh, from a sequencing standpoint uh, is if I'm and if my airstream has a separate black and gray tank, Brian, I know that you have a combo uh, black and gray tank on your base camp. But from a sequencing standpoint, when it's time to empty the tanks, and I've uh, you know made the connection between the airstream and wherever I'm going to dump it, uh, I'll always pull the black tank first. Um, and then I'll flush it with the gray tank. Uh, so I always do the, that kind of black gray sequence just to get everything uh, out of the tank with you know, water from the shower and water from the sink. And then I'll also, uh, if I'm able to use the fresh water flush. Uh, so this is right on the kind of same utility side of the Airstream um, above, I believe the, can't remember, but it's, it's clearly marked. Um, and this is where you hook up a, a, a garden hose and feed fresh water into it. There's a spray jet inside the black tank that helps flush out any debris that might be in there. So um, every time you camp, it's a great thing to do. It keeps odors uh, minimized and, and keeps everything clean. And then just a, kind of a couple of details of things that are on this screen. This clear valve here is amazing um, because often once you pull the tank, well, how do you know when it's empty? And so this is a great simple uh, way to visually indicate uh, where you are in emptying your tank. So it's super helpful there. And then uh, this uh, hose support that's featured here in the picture is really great, I find, if I'm going to be at a full hookup campsite kind of keeps the angle right. Um, so it, things will properly drain into the, uh, the sewer hookup at the campsite. I won't use that if I'm just you know, emptying it at a, at a dump station somewhere along the way. And then one other tip here, if you are at a full hookup campsite, well, you do have an abundant supply of electricity and water. You don't wanna just uh, sit there with your tank valves open. Uh, particularly in the black tank, you might get toilet paper and other debris that basically, because there's not a momentum of, uh, of water to push everything out, you might get stuff that gets halfway down and then dries up and it, it's, it's no good. So um, keep, keep the tanks closed and then keep an eye on them. And you know, maybe every couple of days you just go through and, uh, and open the black and then close it and then open the gray and then close it. And if you wanna do that fresh water flush again there too, I'll actually, when I do that freshwater flush, I'll keep the valve closed in the black tank, let it get a little bit of water. Um, so when I do open the valve, it's kind of like a, a torrent of water to help stuff flush out. Uh, some questions in the chat around this one. Yeah, um, so I see so Whit Whitley's, yeah. I, I can cover Whitley there. Uh, so yeah. with the base camp um, being a combination tank, I mean, you do end up with a lot more gray water in there. Um, but what we kind of do to help do that is that we'll flush, we'll drain the whole tank. Uh, we will run some water inside just kind of as a pre-flush, but as well, we actually have an adapter for the outlet hose that allows us to actually run and connect our water hose to it. And it'll actually do a water jet shot back into the tank. And we found using this, and we'll usually do it two or three times, works really nice to toss in a bunch of extra water in the bottom of the tank and help clear that out. Great. And, and Bill, I think Bill's question is, is there a concern about you know, sewer gas if the drain hose uh, is left hooked to the sewer or should it be disconnected uh, and the tank dumped when full? Um, I, I've left mine on, but the valves closed on the Airstream um, and that, that's worked fine, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, if you would follow up with us at the hello at airstream.com, we'll, we'll post the email at the end. Uh, we can track down uh, the official answer. Um, so Mike says, I have for years kept the gray valve open at a full hookup campsite. Is that wrong? No, ab absolutely not. Um, I've, I was mentioning that um, that particular sequence just to use the gray water to flush. But if you're going to be at a full hookup campsite for a week, um, you know, you can flush it at the end. You could do a fresh water flush. Um, in between the black tank flushes. So all, all good there, Mike. Um, and then Mark asks, does it cause uh, issues if you get food particles in the gray tank? I, I haven't had an issue with this other than, you know, if you think about the kind of the water in the gray tank, 
you're introducing more stuff for bacteria. I've actually been surprised how bad the gray water tank can smell <laughs> when you flush it. Um, so you're just adding bacteria in there, but I can't see any real big issues with that. All right, uh, so next up here oh. is, oh yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Sorry, actually, before we got to the hooking up to sewer and dumping, one thing that would actually be good to note um, is the, the tank treatment uh, packets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we didn't really touch on that, but uh, it's something that's good to have and put in there, especially if you aren't hooked up to full drainage. Um, we we usually put one in every time or a half one because our tank's pretty small um, just to treat the septic water that goes in there. So it helps break it down a little bit better. So when you do go to flush, it flushes a lot better. And that's a um, the liquid or the tablets? What are you guys using? Um, we've used both actually. So at first we bought the liquid. So they came in the little, I think it was like a 30 or 40 milliliter bottle and we pour in half just through the toilet. Mm -hmm. And then we've used the one that kind of looked like those dishwasher packets and we tossed yep. one of those in. So we've had both, both work good. Awesome. Um, and so Mike, Mike had a, a follow-up question about the gray water flush. Uh, it says, when you say gray water flush, are you saying turn on all the sinks in the shower? Um, um, great question, and uh, I can offer a little bit of clarity there. So gray water flush uh, was really about using the gray water to flush the hose uh, after you've done the black tank flush. So using that not so dirty water to kind of clean everything out. So gray water flush is just kind of the sequence of that. But um, there's a great uh, Ask an Air Streamer that we've done around winterizing that goes into tank treatments and kind of things that you should do to get the plumbing system ready. Some good info there. We'll, we'll post a, a link to that webinar here in a minute. All right, so now we've gotten all of the, uh, the necessary things out of the way. Uh, we've figured out a utility situation. We've, we've backed in or level. And I think this is the most fun part, right? Setting up camp. Uh, so we, we're two different kind of chapters to this. One is uh, the outside setup routine, and then we'll transition to the inside. So uh, Ryan, walk us, walk us through uh, what you guys do with your base camp. So for us, it's, it's, I mean, it's actually fairly quick for us, which is nice because it is a small trailer, but um, like you said, it is fun to kind of set it up and get it looking nice. So we'll pull up once we get unhooked. Uh, Melissa usually heads inside and she'll start, you know, organizing the inside, but I'll uh, outside once the trailer's set up, leveled, chalked and everything is secured, obviously all this stuff's hooked up. We start, we'll get the awning set up, which our awning's a little different just because the base camp doesn't come with one. So what I've come up with, it's a wrap tarp and we use, it's either an 11 or a 12 millimeter climbing rope and it feeds into, there's a Keter rail on the top of the base camp that we use to secure the tarp to the trailer. And then from there, we just have standard tarp poles and tarp ropes, which we, uh, nail down and it actually gives us a nice large area to cover off and then with that we actually have a larger area rug that's an indoor outdoor one we actually got it from ikea works pretty nice um and it and then that way we actually have a little area outside the trailer that isn't just all dust and dirt um so i'll do all of that uh the, the big one is i mean we're going to touch on it more later with the portion on on dogs and pets um, is I'll actually set up a bit of a dog run. So I'll touch more on that later. But then as well, I'll get uh, our camp chairs set up, move the picnic table if we want to get in a better location. And then if we have the trees for it, we'll actually set up our hammocks because it's nice to be able to have those set up and be able to rock some those as well. Awesome. And, and uh, Beth, Beth asked the question that I was going to make sure that we followed up on. So you used a term called the Keter, Keter rail, is that right? Yeah, K-E-D-E-R, okay. yeah. Okay, and this is the track that comes from the factory uh, on, on the base camp that you can, there's a, I think a factory awning solution, but you actually got really creative and said, oh, I can actually put a uh, rope in there that fits in there the same size. Um, and let me go, let me go back to this picture since we're talking about it. Um, do you remember the, you might've mentioned it and I missed it, what's, what's the, size of the rope that fits in there uh, i'll have to double check and confirm and we can put it to the notes i want to say it was an 11 millimeter climbing rope um so we got that from our local it's a mech store so it's a mountain equipment co-op um and we just picked okay. up a section of that i cut it to length and then i used the ends just so they're sealed up 
and then there's four or five loop rings on the tarp that I'm able to feed the rope through and then slide that in. Um, ultimately, what I'd like to do with this tarp is you can actually buy Keter specific uh, attachment. So it's it's like a rope that you can actually yeah. sew to a tarp or something to slide into the Keter rail. Brilliant. Love it. Uh, I love the creativity. Um, one other thing here I have on uh, on my Airstream or with my Airstream is I found, I think I found it on Amazon. Um, it's a sand mat and it allows you to have a big outdoor space, but has little holes in it. So as people are walking around, it has holes to let the sand fall through. Um, so it's really helpful instead of tracking stuff inside. It's a way to kind of keep the area clean. Uh, so one of my, yeah, super helpful. Um, so let's go from outside to inside. What are some of the kind of essentials and routine that you guys do? Yeah. Oh, one thing I missed that's actually probably Melissa's favorite for the outside is the string lights. So as long as we have shore power, we will go through and we actually, you can see it in that picture if you flip back one more. Um, we do have a section of string lights that we uh, we run and go through the tarp posts and we'll run it down. Um, to power. So unfortunately, those ones do only run off the AC power. So we do need shore power. I do know there are some solar ones that are pretty nice you can get as well. Um, just set some nice ambience and gives you some outdoor light that isn't just quite as harsh yeah. as the entrance exit light in the base camp. There's a completely agree. And then um, some of the, I think these are the, the bare bones lights. So uh, the bottom right next to the flamingo lights, they make awesome lights and they're all battery powered and there are plenty of solutions that uh, that are all battery powered as well um, to create that cool outdoor lighting. All right, take us to the inside. So inside, lucky for me, uh, Melissa, my wife, pretty much takes care of most of this. Um, when I get there, she'll go inside, get it all set up so we can, you know, get the dogs inside because usually by the time we arrive, it's past dinner because we head out on a Friday. Um, we actually, for the bed, um, because ours is a bed dinette in the back that um, converts, typically we'll set the bed up before we even leave the cat, we leave home. So we'll get it in there. She has bedding. We have a king. It's actually a king size duvet that fits in there really nice for the base camp, uh, pillows and all that kind of stuff. So that'll be all set up before we even get there. Um, but what she'll do is she'll just check, tidy it up. And then um, there's a couple of braces that go underneath the bed that she'll just check to make sure it didn't shift while towing. Um, from there, then we'll start unpacking the front end. Uh, we've got some nice baskets that go down into the cabinets below that we use for the dry goods and different uh, meals and just different snacks and stuff that we'll bring up onto the counters. Uh, we've got a speaker for music. Um, our kettle, very important for the morning coffee. So we always have mm -hmm. to make sure that's out and ready. And then actually the nice thing with the base camp is you can see it in the top right of the photo. There's actually these overhead baskets and a lot of our dry goods and food and stuff ends up staying up there. So it's really actually not a ton of work to unpack those. So from there, that's, that's basically it. It's a, it's a whopping 97 square meet, square feet. So we don't have a ton <laughs> of space, but we don't need a ton of space and it makes it really easy and really quick to set up. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, the, the smaller it is, the easier it is to take care of and set up and put away and clean. So yeah, I totally agree. Um, just two quick additions to this one. We, we did uh, one of these sessions on organizing and organization um, that I think would be really helpful for folks. So we'll, we'll drop a link to that in the, in the chat as well. And then I found just in terms of where to put things, that are in the vehicle while it's in motion. So while you're while you're towing, if we're talking about a, a travel trailer, is generally things in front of the axle, so in front of the wheels. That area tends to move less than the stuff behind the axle. So if you think about you know going to, on the school bus in uh, on the way to school, sitting in the back of the bus was always much more bumpy than sitting in the front of the bus. Uh, so same goes. So if you have something fragile. Um, I you know, would consider putting it more towards the front of the trailer um, versus the back. So learn the hard way on that one. So not surprising, a lot of folks who are on, uh, who have joined us today are part of the Airstream community, love to travel with their pets. Uh, 
We have a dog in this picture. I know you have two beautiful golden retrievers. I have seen people with all sorts of pets, birds, like it's amazing. Uh, but having an Airstream lets you, you know, gives you the freedom to be able to do that. So uh, you have an awesome idea for a dog run, but kind of walk us through your approach uh, on all things, um, in this case, all things dogs. Yeah. So actually, when we when we get set up, we actually keep them in the vehicle at first, uh, just because Melissa's setting up a side. Um, just a little difference there than putting them in the trailer. Uh, ours doesn't really have the room to put them in there and set up, so we keep them in the vehicle. But we make sure, you know, if the if it's hot, then we keep it. We just leave the vehicle run with the AC going. Um, or if it's nice out, my little trick on the photo on the right, the front jack actually works kind of like a nice hitching rail, and I can just put them there, and then they'll just chill at the front of the trailer while we get everything set up. Now for the dogs, the one thing, and it was a friend of mine that gave us this idea is you can do a cable or a rope, but you run it between two trees um, as long as you want, really depending on the size of your campsite, but you run it at about the height of their leash. So in essential, and then I actually have some pulleys that I put on, or we use a rope and I have pulleys that we put on top. And so what this does is it ends up being a dog run so to say so that they have 20 30 40 feet that they can run back and forth between the trees and because it's at the height that their leash is at they can't run around and get tangled around the trees around either end well most of the time every now and then they will stretch it a bit and get wrapped around and then we got to go untangle them but it gives them a lot more freedom just to kind of saunter around and get a little more freedom than being there so this works really nice for bigger dogs obviously i've seen a lot of people with smaller dogs use netting or uh, like wired uh, corrals almost, cart little like fences that go up. But for our guys, that's not quite an option because they'll just jump it and run away to meet whoever's at the next campsite. Yeah, a, a, a dog's playground for sure. Oh, Ryan, yeah. do you, do you when you, let's say that you guys are you know out, out somewhere, I assume the answer is it depends, but I just want to walk through this a little bit. So you're traveling with your pet, you guys go out to dinner, out to lunch. Do you leave the, the dogs in the base camp or where, where do the dogs stay when they can't go with you? Yeah, so, and actually, this is actually one of the main reasons we got our base camp is because we do a lot of mountain biking, we do backcountry uh, split boarding or ski touring and mm -hmm. a lot of and activities that the dogs can't come with. So we're lucky that these guys are pretty chill and we take them for walks and we do stuff again, make sure they're tired. But then when we're gone, they just chill and sleep in the bed. Um, the first few ones that we did, we actually set up our phone with a hotspot. We actually had a camera and temperature yeah. sensor and everything. And we actually monitored it for the first, you know, half a dozen trips just to see what it would do. And up to about 25 Celsius, we can run the vent fan with the pop out windows open and they're fine. Yeah. Anything hotter yeah. than that. And then we have to run the AC to make sure it stays nice and cool in there for them. But yeah, they'll just, they'll sleep in the trailer. Um, the windows are nice and tinted, so they don't really get seen in there much uh, so they don't get bothered but then as well it does have like the front three windows we will roll up our blackout blinds just to a keep the sun out and b you know not give them so many distractions so they're not you know getting excited by people wandering around or something makes makes perfect sense and for for those of us uh not on the metric system uh 25c is about 77 degrees fahrenheit Sorry, usually uh, just, I'm better at doing those conversions. It's, I wasn't on it's the okay. It's all right. No, no problem at all. It's good to get to flex that muscle. Uh, all right. So, so the next part of this is really around um, ideas to get folks who are, are new to air streaming. What are some of the things that are out there to make uh, the experience more enjoyable, uh, a, a bit, uh, a bit easier? So, these are just some quick different collections to get folks. Uh, you know, started on um, enjoying the airstream experience. So this first one is really all around cooking outside. I love to cook outside, especially in the summertime, because then you're not heating up the inside of the airstream. But anything that is collapsible, like these two uh, bowls or cooking pots on the left, amazing, uh, just in terms of storage and flexibility. Outdoor stove, it's great to be able to, to kind of have an outdoor cooking experience. Uh, and not just when it's it's warm out, but just just in general. Um, the next one here is really around cooking around the fire. Uh, so everyone thinks about you know s'mores around the fire, but actually you know preparing a meal 
uh, around the fire is, is, is really enjoyable too. So here's some, some things, we'll drop links to the chats, the links to these in the chat, but just so folks can get an idea of the different tools to make uh, cooking easier. And then uh, what would the outdoors be if you didn't have the you know, ability to kind of have fun with the family? Uh, I've tested this or, or you kayak at the, at the top, which is really fun way to be able to have a kayak without having the space of a traditional kayak out there. So some games we, here. We really want, we really want to buy those. We, they, they released some black ones now that are gorgeous I saw those. and yeah. we, we want them. <laughs> the, the first time you do it, you feel like you're doing the world's biggest origami challenge, but once you get past yeah. that, it's actually really, really good. But that's cool that you've used them and liked them. Yeah, there's a little bit of like, will this actually work? And they work great and they're, they're awesome. So um, last one here, I know we're kind of getting towards the end. So if, if folks have any open questions, uh, click the Q&A button and just uh, drop your questions in there and we'll, we'll get them answered. But Airstream has been around for 91 years now. So they have a lot of great resources that go into uh, making the experience easier for folks. So I just wanted to cover uh, the different ways that you know, people can get help on their journey. Uh, first one is your local dealer is an amazing resource. Uh, they, you know, Airstream has 70 plus of them uh, across the country, across North America. Uh, but but these, this is your, your, your partner in questions, getting things serviced. And then, you know, in, in addition to that, the folks in Jackson Center, Ohio, where your Airstream came from, uh, is a, a group of warm, talented, knowledgeable folks uh, who, who can answer, I'll say pretty much any question as it relates to Airstream. Uh, they have access to an incredible library of, of resources uh, in addition to some of those folks who work on that team have been there uh, for decades. So they have a lot of great knowledge, uh, knowledge there. Uh, but as you can see, those folks are really there Monday through Friday from, from eight to five to supplement the support experience there's a, uh, a partner that Airstream works with called CoachNet. I've used them before. I had uh, an awning that wouldn't close uh, a couple of years after having my Airstream because of a fuse. And, and they, I called them, they were able to help, um, had, had an experienced person uh, on the phone. They actually bought an Airstream so they could you know, speak the language uh, and, and help other owners as they go through it. And the cool thing about this is three years of it is included with the purchase of your Airstream, which is awesome. Uh, bottom row here is Airstream Addicts and Air Forums. These are really online resources, uh, incredibly helpful community here. If you, you know, pop it and say, hey, I have a question about this, day or night, usually you'll have a response. Usually it's the right one. Usually it's accurate and true. Uh, in terms of being able to troubleshoot something or, or you know, having a question about the product in general. So a lot of folks you know, begin their Airstream journey here asking questions, but it's a great place to continue uh, with, with having access to resources. Uh, we'll drop a link to this uh, Airstream Academy resource in the chat. But for those of you who have taken delivery of an Airstream or you're about to, uh, you're, there's a lot of information that's shared in your walkthrough where you're basically learning everything about your Airstream. So it's a lot of information. A lot of folks will videotape it and take notes. Um, Airstream realizes that and actually took that same format, uh, but, but chunked it up into little bite-sized pieces and created really easy to consume content uh, online where you can say, uh, take me to a Globetrotter and awning, and I forgot what I needed to do to do the awning. Here's a video, here's a, a written article. So great resource, model specific. Um, so, so really uh, kind of tuned into um, your particular vehicle. And then the other one here is a good old fashioned owner's manual and they're all digitized and online. You can open the PDF search particular term uh, or issue. So Brian, I'll, I'll put you on the spot. What's, where do you usually go to when you have uh, questions uh, about your Airstream? So I, I have used, there is the the Airstream forums that I have used in the past, um, but similar, I'm, I'm active in the car community a lot. We always had forums and everything. That was kind of the go-to place to get answers. But as of late, um, it's the trailer specific Facebook groups that are the yeah. most active. And usually 
um, a quick search in those have been able to find a good chunk of my answers and issues that I've had. Um, even as far as like our Truma panel, we uh, when we winter camped, it was minus 30. The panel shorted out because there was condensation and it died. And um, Going on there, we were able to figure it out in five minutes what was wrong and kind of sort it out and get it working again, so. Awesome. Yeah, the, a lot of yeah. a lot of great resources online. Um, yeah, so which, now, which we uh, do have. Oh, we do have. Sorry, I was going to add on. Uh, we do have CoachNet as well, uh, but thankfully, so far we haven't had to use them for anything. But at least I know it's there. Yeah, no, they're they're super super helpful. It's the the peace of mind sometimes. It's uh is is worth uh worth its weight in gold. So we have about five minutes left. I see some questions coming in. Uh, on the chat, so I will uh, I will work through those, and then we'll share the promo code for Airstream Supply Company. So, um, let's see. Bill asks, with the 50 amp ACs on a 2020 Classic, so you have two two ACs, um, will it damage the ACs to run them uh, in order to charge the refrigerant system if only connected to 30 amp? So, Bill, I'm going to ask if you could send that to hello at airstream.com because that's a technical question and I want to make sure that we get you the right technical answer to it. So um, we'll look for that one, Bill, from you at the hello at Airstream, the email address is on the screen and we'll, uh, we'll get that routed and find the right answer for you. Someone else asks, how do you drain the freshwater tank on a 2022 flying cloud? What's the max amount of time before I should drain the freshwater tank out? Um, and you bet, uh, happy to uh, do the webinar. So um, they're in your manual, uh, and there's also in the winterizing video, we go through how to drain the fresh water out of a 2022 or out of, out of any Airstream vehicle. But in your manual, if you specifically search fresh water, it'll show you where the valves are more than likely uh, to, to get at least the waters out of the tank. You'll have some uh, valves that are underneath uh, the Airstream, usually near the tires. And, I'm not familiar with your exact model, but your your manual will, will give you some uh, insight into that. Um, and then the video that we did on um, on uh, winterizing will also show. So Daniel Molina says uh, the valve is between the tires on the street side. So you'll see him hanging down there. Uh, and if you open uh, open that, you'll uh, you'll see it's a white plastic valve. So thank you, Daniel, for that. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. So Kathy says, Hey, I have a 50 amp. How do I use a 30 amp post? I see Ryan stepping the answer, but for everyone else, um, this is where you'll get an adapter. Uh, so you'll get a 50 to 30 amp adapter. Um, and the thing to be, to, uh, to know in that situation is if it sounds like you have two air conditioners, you're probably not going to be able to run them both at the same time. Uh, and you know what will happen is you'll end up tripping the breaker at the pedestal. Um, so no no damage likely done there, but um, you just have to manage your energy usage a little bit more. Um, Beth has a good one. Uh, how do you and this Ryan, this is for you. How do you pack and carry those Edison lights to and from campsites? How big is the carry bag? Are, are they so, the glass Edison ones or the plastic ones? No, so yeah, these ones are plastic. So that okay. makes life a lot easier. Um, they do a couple of them got a little scuffed up just from transport, but they, when I roll them up into a thing, it, it doesn't take up more, like there's no bag for it, unfortunately, but it yeah. would fit in a small grocery bag or smaller even. But the nice thing is at the back of the base camp, there's a little cubby uh, just to the right of the door that you can see on the picture there um, that they actually just fit right in the back there. So they're nice and easy to grab when we show up to the site to get them set up. Awesome. Yeah, I have... I think two two sets of those myself, and they. I think the worst that happened once is I, I one of the plastic globes got crushed, and I just bought, bought a new one on Amazon. So that's the uh, end of the webinar. So Ryan, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to share your knowledge and expertise, and for being part of the Airstream community. There's a code on the screen here for Airstream Supply Company. So we pop some links throughout our talk today that link directly to that. So use this code save yourself some money. And then please keep an eye out for the two question survey that will pop up right after we wrap up today. We'd love your feedback on uh, what we can do better in future editions. So Brian, thanks again. Have a good weekend and we'll see everybody next time. Bye. Thanks for having me.